shrouded in darkness. Chaos is all we see. Violence, oppression, and destruction surround us. No matter how dark the situation becomes, we are reminded of these two words. But God. But God won't let our hearts be troubled. The storm is raging on. But God will calm the sea. The enemy is attacking. But God will overcome. In this life we will have many tribulations. But God will have the last word. God is not done. Well, good morning and welcome. It's so good to see you here. My name's Jason. I'm one of the pastors on staff and we're gonna get into it, all right? We're in Genesis chapter 41. If you have your Bibles, your workbooks, let's go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 41 where we have been on this journey for over a year walking through this book of Genesis. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking closely at the life of this guy, Joseph. And what we've seen is Joseph's life was filled with a whole lot of ups and downs. And for most of his life that we've seen so far, it's been a lot more downs than ups. And back in chapter 37, we saw he got a really nice coat and he had two great dreams. Outside of that, he has spent the better part of a decade now, either in a pit or in a prison. But what we've seen every step of the way with him is that God has been with Joseph, and that God has been faithful to Joseph every step of the way. And even though Joseph was far from perfect, what we see out of Joseph's life is that Joseph has also been faithful to God. And in this moment of his life, this, this season of, of pits and prisons, we know that God is using this time, that this isn't a wasted moment in his life, his life isn't on pause. God is working in these moments, in these prison moments of his life. He's bringing about some deep soul change, some life change. He's been transforming Joseph. And it's what he does in our lives too. And these pit and prison moments in our life, that these moments aren't wasted moments. That God is working, he's transforming us. As we wrapped up last week, I shared with you four things about transformation. Number one, transformation happens best in hardship. Don't know why it is, don't know why we don't learn lessons the easy way. We always have to learn them the hard way, but that's just the way it is. And number two, transformation takes time. You can't microwave, you can't drive through, you can't order on Amazon transformation and it be here the next day. It just takes time. And number three, transformation doesn't feel good in the moment. Man, change, growth, it never feels good in the moment. It hurts, it's painful. But that leads us to the fourth point about transformation. Transformation makes sense in the rear view mirror. So many times in the moment we don't understand. So many times when we're going through this season of transformation, it doesn't make a lot of sense for us. But we get through it and we start to look back. As we look back, we go, ah, that's what he was doing. That's what all of that was about. It makes sense in the rear view mirror. And so where we left off last week with Joseph is Joseph had just interpreted interpreted two dreams, one for the chief cupbearer and one for the chief baker. They landed in prison for something they did wrong. They had dreams. Joseph interprets their dreams, and he tells one, you got some good news coming, and tells the other one, not so good news. And then he looks to the one, that this cupbearer, and says, you're gonna go back to Pharaoh. So when you go back to Pharaoh, don't you dare forget about me. And so last week as I was watching the Super Bowl and I saw Travis Kelsey yelling on the sideline at his coach, I thought about Joseph because this is the image I thought when he's talking to the cupbearer. Don't you dare forget about me. I hooked you up, now you hook me up. Don't forget about me. And as we read the last words of chapter 40 last week, what we saw is the cupbearer did just that. He forgot about Joseph. He didn't just forget about him. It actually says that he never gave him another thought. I mean, he got out of prison, got his job back, and he didn't care about that guy that he met in prison that interpreted his dream. And so what we see is now Joseph is going into another season of waiting. Another season of waiting. What happens to us when we find ourselves in these seasons of waitings, we're forced to look not just at what God is doing, but we're forced to look at who God is. 
Because so many times when we find ourselves in those seasons, we lose sight of this upper story. We lose sight of what God might be doing. And sometimes we even lose sight of what he's doing in our lives. And we need to remember that what he's doing in our lives during this season, during this pit and prison moments, he's going to use in our lives when we get out of our pit and prison moments. And so we see God doing a work on the life of this guy, Joseph. And here's what you need to know about God. Before God promotes you in public, he's going to prepare you in private. And so here is Joseph. He can't find a more private place. He is in prison. He's in the darkness of a prison and God is doing a work in his life. And what God is using in Joseph's life is humility. Say humility with, with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Man, you don't wanna say that word. I get it, all right? No one likes that word, humility. But humility seems to be one of these things that God uses to shape our life, to chisel our life, to mold our life. When there's something that God wants to produce in us, humility seems to be like God's go-to tool to bring us to that place where we need to be what he's created us to be. And I don't know if you can think back in your lifetimes that God has used humility to teach you a lesson. I was thinking about it this week when I first came to Christ Church back in 2000. I was the elementary kids pastor for this church. And I came here working with the elementary kids and I was super excited to work with them. But the reality for me and my family, this young family, is what I was being paid could not pay all of my bills. And so in order to pay my bills, I had to pick up a little bit of a side hustle, a side job here at the church. And so I joined the cleaning crew here at the church. And my job in my early days was to clean the offices and the bathrooms of my fellow staff members. And so I'll never forget going and getting the big trash card and and after hours going pushing through the hallways here up on the third floor and going to people's offices and emptying their trash and get the vacuum cleaner out and vacuum their offices. And man, oh man, when I first started doing it, I did not like the job. I'm like, man, why am I doing this? I can't believe I have to do this. And I really did it begrudgingly because I really didn't like the job. I probably, if I'm being honest, felt like it's, man, I shouldn't have to do this. But what God began to do is just work in me and work in my heart. And it didn't happen overnight, let me tell you. It took a while for God to teach me some lessons. And what he started teaching me is, hey, Jason, you have an opportunity now. You have an opportunity every time you walk into someone's office to pray for them. And so what I began to do is shift my mentality a little bit. I walked in, I was changing trash or vacuuming. I started praying for that teammate for them and for their family and for their ministry and I'd shut their door and go to the next office. And so several times a week, three times a week, as I walked the halls, emptied the trash and vacuumed floors and cleaned the bathrooms, I was praying over my teammates. And little did I know what God was preparing me for because I had no idea what the future would hold. But later on, I began to recognize and realize what God was doing in my life in that moment. And what he was doing, he was saying, Jason, before you lead these people, you need to serve these people. And so God is always working in the private of our lives to prepare us for what he wants to do publicly in our lives. And I don't know about you, but here's what I know about humility. Humility is not natural. Humility is supernatural. Because it's up to me, it's up to you, it's all about me, right? It's all about you. And we need the Holy Spirit in us to help us to find that place of humility, and what I've seen and what I've experienced in my life, what we're seeing here in the life of Joseph, when we find ourselves in these pit and prison moments, these seasons of waiting, what it forces us to do is to choose. Am I gonna trust in in the Holy Spirit or am I gonna trust in the flesh? And and here's what I know about God. Here's what I love about God. God is so patiently loving with us. What he will do is he will allow us to remain where we are until we learn what we need to learn. He's gonna let us stay where we are and learn the lesson that we need to learn as long as it takes for us to learn that lesson. But here's what you and I do. You and I wanna get out of these moments as quickly as possible. Like, man, let's get out of here. And so what we wanna do is we wanna run away. And so we start running away from these transformation moments in our lives. And we run away from the hard things in our life, the the suffering in our life, the problems in our life. And so we run away from, from the job we're in. Or we run away from the marriage that we have. Or we run away from the church that we might be attending because we think, you know, getting away, getting to a new environment, getting to a new job, uh, getting into a new marriage, getting to a, a new church, that's gonna solve my problems. But here's the truth. Changing locations does not change what God is trying to do in you. I mean, you can change the zip code all you want, but when the problem's not out there, the problem's in here, you're just carrying that problem with you. 
And so God is going to lovingly and patiently allow you to remain where you are until you learn whatever he's trying to teach you. And so we've seen this in Joseph's life. I mean, he's been in prison 10 years and we wrapped up our story last week. We jump into 41, he's got two more years. And this is the kid who had dreams. Chapter 37, it begins with these dreams that everybody's bowing down to him. And now that's not happening. And so what we see is his interpretation was correct. His timing was just a bit off. Because you see, God had to do some things in him. God had a huge calling for Joseph's life. And Joseph's character was not yet ready for the calling. God had some work to do on that character. God had some work to do on his heart. And so God was going to shape him and mold him so that the character of Joseph was going to reach the level of the calling that God had on his life. And what God was using in Joseph's life and what he uses in our lives, humility. He uses humility. In fact, James chapter four, verse 10, it says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. I mean, the kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. Humble yourself before and he will be the one who lifts you up. God doesn't care about your resume. He doesn't care about the amount of of diplomas you have on the wall. He doesn't care about all the awards you've received. He doesn't care about all the followers you have on social media. What God cares about is your heart. And what God cares about is Joseph's heart. And he's been working on Joseph's heart for the better part of a decade, trying to transform that heart so his character can match this calling. And he's using humility as a tool. And so let me ask you a question as we jump into this conversation today and look at the next part of Joseph's story. Where is God using humility in your life right now? Think about it for a second. Where might he be using humility in your life right now? Is it in your marriage? Maybe as a parent. (laughs) Oh my goodness. How many times have our kids taught us humility, moms and dads? I mean, maybe it's in your finances or maybe it's at work right now. I mean, where might God be using humility in your life to prepare you, to teach you, to transform you so that you can be who he's created you to be? I mean, what we've seen is over a decade that God has been working and using humility to train up and prepare Joseph. And so for the past two years now, since he was forgotten by this cupbearer, God's been working on Joseph's life. But he hasn't just been working on Joseph's life, he's also been working on Pharaoh's life as well. And so as we pick up in chapter 41, what we see, we see Pharaoh has two dreams. He goes to bed one night, closes his eyes, and he has two crazy dreams. He wakes up in the morning and he's freaking out. He's like, whoa, what in the world just happened? What did I just dream? And so he calls in all of his best and brightest, all of his advisors, all of his wise men. He calls in his cupbearer. He calls anybody in who might be able to give him what this dream means. And he brings them all in and they're all looking at each other, scratching their heads going, I don't know. Do you know? I don't know. And all of a sudden, the cupbearer remembers something. And so that's where we're gonna pick up in Joseph's story, chapter 41. We're gonna pick up in verse number nine. And so here we are. It says this in verse nine. Finally, the king's chief cupbearer spoke up. Today I have been reminded of my failure. Oops. He told Pharaoh, some time ago you were angry with the chief cupbaker and me and you imprisoned us in the palace of the captain of the guard. One night, the chief baker and I each had a dream, and each dream had its own meaning, and there was a young Hebrew man with us in prison who was a slave of the captain of the guard. And we told him our dreams, and he told us what each of our dreams meant. And everything happened just as he predicted. I was restored to my position as cupbearer, and the chief baker was executed and impaled on a pole. Oops, boss, my bad. Uh, I, I completely blew it. I remember back a couple years ago when you were mad at me and, 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 and we, we, let's not rehash that, but you put me in jail, you put me in prison while I was there, I had these dreams, so did the baker and we came down to breakfast and there was this Hebrew guy there and he could see that we had long faces, that we were confused. We kind of looked like, you look right now, boss. And, and, and he said, what's wrong? And we said, we had these dreams, we didn't understand what they meant. He says, tell me. Tell me, maybe I can give you an interpretation. And boy, oh boy, did he. He nailed it. I mean, he got mine right. He got the baker's right. He nailed it. I mean, this guy understands dreams. And we're left with this question now. How quickly can things change? 
When we find ourselves in that season of pits and prisons, how quickly can that season change for us? We'll look at the next verse and we'll see. It says this in verse 14. Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once. Say at once. Man, that was really lame, all right? I know it's rainy out. Let's try it again. At once. There we go. You're with me. Joseph was sent for at once. And he was quick, quickly brought from the prison. After he shaved and changed his clothes, he went in and stood before Pharaoh. How quickly can things change? Just like that. Just like that, things can change. Things can change immediately, in an instant. And so please hear me. If things haven't changed for you yet, then God's not done with you. If you're still in your season of your pit or your prison, you're still in this season of waiting, then guess what? Maybe God's still not done with you. He's still gracefully going to allow you to remain where you are until you grow and become who he knows that you can be. And so here's Joseph now. His season of waiting is coming to an end. 13 years, 13 years of waiting in an instant. He goes from prison to the palace. They bring him in, they, they, take, they give him a shower because I'm sure he stunk, and they shave him up and they give him some new clothes. Say, hey, you're about ready to walk in front of Pharaoh. And the very next verse, verse 15, he comes before Pharaoh and he says, I had a dream last night and no one here can tell me what it means. But I've heard that when you hear about a dream, that you can interpret it. I hear you're the dream guy. I hear you're on the dream team. I hear you're, you're the dreamer. I hear if anybody can tell me what my dream is going to mean, man, it's you. So tell me, can you do it? And the next verse, you need to outline, you need to circle, you need to, to highlight, you need to put a star by it because this is the verse that shows us and tells us that the 13 years that Joseph was in a pit or prison wasn't a waste of time because we're about to hear the heart change that God has been working for in Joseph. Listen to what it says in verse 16. He says, it is beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied, but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. Here in this moment, we see that Joseph knows it's no longer about him. I mean, Joseph began his life, and for 13 years, God, God's been using humility to, to teach this lesson to Joseph that what God is doing in his life, what God wants to do through his life, that it's not just about Joseph, it's about a bigger plan. It's about God. And so Pharaoh then tells Joseph these two dreams that he had, and Pharaoh says, I had these two dreams, and had dreams about these cows. There were seven really plump and healthy cows and they were eating next to the river and next thing I knew, out of the river come these nasty, gnarly, skinny cows that look like the cover of a, of a Zeppelin album and they come out of the, the river and they eat and they gobble up all these healthy cows. Freaked me out, Joseph. And then I had another one, it's kinda like it. And there were, there were seven uh, heads of, of weed and they were healthy and they looked plentiful, but then there was these seven sunburnt and withered and gnarly looking heads of wheat and they came over and they gobbled up all the healthy, healthy uh, things of wheat. So, so what does that mean? And listen, anytime you see the number seven in the Bible, just know uh, the Hebrew author is writing to a Hebrew audience. That number means something. That's the number of God. And when you see it seven times seven, you see two sevens in there, you just know that the upper story is about to be revealed. And so you're seeing God being, beginning to move here. And so Joseph looks at him and said, hey, this is the same dream. You had the same dream twice. And that, that seven means there's gonna be seven good years and the other seven, the, the skinny cows, those, those gnarly looking heads of, of wheat, it's gonna be seven bad years. And so you gotta understand there's gonna be seven good years and seven bad years. And, and so Pharaoh's like, whoa, whoa. And listen to what he says. He says, this will happen just as I have described it. For God has revealed to Pharaoh in advance what he's about to do. The next seven years will be a period of great prosperity throughout the land of Egypt, but afterwards there will be seven years of famine so great that all the prosperity will be forgotten in Egypt. Have you ever had a season of life like that? Where, where things are so good, things are amazing, but all of a sudden you get through this season of life where things have gone great in your marriage, things are great at work, things are great at school, things are great, everything's going great, and the next thing you know, something happens to derail that, and all of a sudden, whatever it is that derailed that season of greatness, all of a sudden, you completely forget about it. Because now you're so consumed with this, this horrible season, and so he's saying that's what's about to happen. 
famine will destroy the land. And this famine will be so severe that even the memory of the good years will be erased. Good times are coming, but hold on, because those good times are not going to last forever. Seven years, to be specific. They're gonna last for seven years, and then after that, it is going to be awful. It's gonna be destruction. It's gonna be desolation. It is going to be death. It is going to be a tough season. And so Joseph isn't here just prepared to interpret this dream, but Joseph has been working all of his life for, for positions of leadership, whether it's in his dad's business, whether it's in Pharaoh's house, or whether it's in prison. Joseph has been prepared by God in all of this season for a, a special leadership role. And listen to the advice that Joseph gives to Pharaoh. Verse 33 says, therefore Pharaoh should find an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh should appoint supervisors over the land and let them collect one fifth of all the crops during the seven good years. Have them gather all the food produced in the good years that are just ahead and bring it to Pharaoh's storehouses. Store it away and guard it there so there will be food in the cities. That way there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come to the land of Egypt. Otherwise, this famine will destroy the land. And it says Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. I mean, do you see what's going on here? You see, the old Joseph, the Joseph 13 years ago, the Joseph that we met in chapter 37 of Genesis would have never said that. You see, that Joseph would have said, I'm the guy. I'm the guy, I had two dreams, everyone's bowing down to me, so, so I'm your answer, Pharaoh, put me in, I'm your answer. But did you notice he doesn't say that? He says, you need to find somebody. You need to find somebody. Maybe in his mind he's thinking, it might be me. But at this point he's learned through humility and what God's been doing in his heart, it might not be him either. He might be going back into prison. But here's what we see through Joseph's life. Joseph has just been faithful time and time again. He was faithful to his father watching over his herds. He was faithful to Potiphar in his house. He was faithful in prison working for them. He was faithful to God. He was faithful and 13 years now have gone by as God has been working and stirring in the hearts of Joseph and now here he is at age 30 and he's finally learned his lesson. He knows exactly what Willie Nelson means when he said, Lord, it's hard to be humble. And because, I mean, humility is not a natural thing. And there was another guy in the Bible that had an issue with humility, somebody who was incredibly close to Jesus and that was the disciple Peter. I mean, here is a guy who's loud and brash, the first to do anything, the first to get out of a boat and walk on water, the first to make a declaration about who Jesus is. I mean, this guy was impulsive. I mean, and I'll never forget that moment at the Last Supper, the night before Jesus goes to the cross, where Jesus is telling the guys about what's just getting ready to happen here in a few hours. And Peter speaks up when Jesus says, someone is going to, to deny me. Peter's like, no, 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 no. All these jokers, all the 11 of these guys, they might but not me, Jesus, not me. You see, what Peter was in desperate need is a little lesson on humility. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, buddy, I'm gonna teach you a really hard lesson tonight. You, yes, you are gonna deny me three times. And we know the story. I mean, we talk about that story on Easter, that just when that rooster crowed for the third time and Peter had denied Jesus for the third time, Peter runs off and the Bible says that he was weeping, that he was crying, he was broken, because in that moment he recognized that in his pride, he had failed. And I love chapter 21 of the book of John because it really captures this moment where Peter and Jesus come back together after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, and now they're up in Galilee before Jesus ascends to heaven, and, and Jesus takes Peter for a walk. And maybe you remember the story, he pulls Peter in close and says, hey Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Jesus, you know I do. Jesus says, well then feed my sheep. And they walk a little further down the beach and Jesus looks at Peter again and says, hey, do you love me? And Peter's like, yes, Jesus, you know I love you. Well, then feed my sheep. A third time, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? And at this point, Peter knows what Jesus is getting at. This lesson about humility, this lesson of pride that he had learned on that night before Jesus was crucified. He was sitting in and he recognized like, yes, Jesus, I learned my lesson. Yes, I love you. Jesus said, all right, good. Now go take care of my sheep. 
And it's this guy, Peter, who learned some really hard lessons about humility that was able to write in his book, in 1 Peter, these words. He says, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Say, at the right time. Turn to the person on your right and say, at the right time. Turn to the person on your left and say, at the right time. Turn to the person on your right and say, he will lift you up. Third person on the left say, he will lift you up. At the right time, yes, he will lift you up. And so now was the right time in Joseph's life. God was going, yes, Joseph, now is the right time. You have learned your lessons. Humility has been teaching you and molding you and preparing you. Now is the right time. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? I mean, here's the reality. Humility is not natural. It is supernatural. And when we see someone, we meet someone in our lives that is humble, we immediately know that person more than likely is of Jesus. I mean, how many times have you met someone in your life? I mean, a man or a woman, someone or a student or a teacher or a coach. I mean, you've just been in their, in their presence and you can just tell by their spirit that they know Jesus. You see, when we're humble, that humility shows people that the Spirit of God is in us because humility isn't natural. It is a byproduct of the Holy Spirit working in us. And so when Pharaoh sees Joseph and goes, man, there's the Spirit of God in him. Now, he doesn't know our God. He doesn't know Joseph's God here. He just knows there's something different about this guy. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court and all my people will take orders from you only. Only I, sitting on the throne, will have a rank higher than yours. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. I mean, in an instant, just like that, he goes from a pit to the palace, the season of brokenness, the season of pain, the season of suffering, the season of being forgotten, the season of hopelessness, and now here he is, boom, he is the second most powerful man on the planet, and God is working in his life. And so please hear me, all right? In our lives, we struggle to give up control. And if we're struggling to give up control, don't be shocked when God just allows you to control your own life. But the moment you say, God, you know what? Yes, it's not about me. I, I'm gonna humble myself. I'm going to trust in your plan and your ways. And God looks at you and says, all right, now we're cooking with fire. Now we can do this. And so now God is ready to use Joseph because this hasn't been just about Joseph. This has been about a bigger God story that he's working. Listen to what happens in verse 42. Pharaoh removed a signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Then he had Joseph ride in a chariot reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, kneel down. Remember he had two dreams that his brothers and his mom and his dad would kneel down. We're beginning to see God's plan unfold here. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or a foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. And here is Joseph just once again been faithful for 13 years, faithful uh, to his father, faithful to Potiphar, faithful in prison, faithful to God, and God is lifting him up. Lifting him up, 13 years He's been working his life, 13 years, he's been trying to transform this heart to build his character for this calling that God has on his life. And so day after day after day, God was working on Joseph's life. Joseph's life wasn't on pause. God was working every single day. And sometimes we find ourselves in these moments, it feels like our life has stopped, our life has paused. That's not what's going on. God, just like in Joseph's life, he is working in those moments. And then listen to what it says in verse 45. I'm gonna hit this quickly and then jump through. It says, then Pharaoh gave Joseph a new Egyptian name, Zaphnath Panea. He also gave him a wife whose name was Asenath. She was the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On. So Joseph took charge of the entire land of Egypt. And here's why I wanted to mention that. Who is the one responsible for giving a son his name, a job, and a wife? 
a father, correct? That is a father's responsibility in biblical times to give his son a name, a job, and a wife. And so what we see here is, again, this undercurrent of what's gonna come to the surface here in the weeks ahead in Joseph's life, this conflict beginning to brew between Joseph's biological father and now his new adopted father and Pharaoh. You're gonna see this, this dad wound in his life, this dad who he was the behor, he was the, the firstborn, the one to get a double blessing, a, a double portion, a double inheritance. And, and his father, in his mind, remember, forgot him. And so now he has this new adopted father in Pharaoh who gives him a new name, gives him a job, and gives him a wife. I'm telling you, you're gonna see the undercurrent of an issue in Joseph's life, but it's gonna spill out not just Joseph's life, it's gonna be a major issue pitting the kingdom of God, the kingdom of peace and shalom versus the kingdom of Egypt, the kingdom of empire. And Joseph, at a point later in his life, just like you and me are gonna be forced to make a decision. Which kingdom, which father am I gonna trust? And so listen to what happens next. We continue through verse 46. He was 30 years old when he began serving the court of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And when Joseph left Pharaoh's presence, he inspected the entire land of Egypt. As predicted, for seven years, the land produced bumper crops. During those years, Joseph gathered all the crops grown in Egypt and stored the grain from the surrounding fields in the cities. He piled up huge amounts of grain like sand on the seashore, Finally, he stopped keeping records because there was too much of everything. And so Joseph did exactly what he told Pharaoh he was going to do. They started planting crops. They started holding some of the crops back. He started building Walmarts after Walmarts after Walmarts after Walmarts all across Egypt to store all of this food. And there was so much food that they quit keeping track of it. And then things turned just as God told them it would. Verse 50 during this time, listen to what happens first. So during this time, before the first of the famine years, two sons were born to Joseph and his wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On. Joseph named, get this, his older son Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. I mean, how would you like to be named, hey, you helped me forget my dad and my brothers? I mean, that's, all, that's what he, he named his first job. Thank you for helping me forget dad, and he abandoned me. Thank you for giving, get, helping me forget my brothers, because they're awful. And so he names his first son Manasseh, and then he names his second son Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in this land of my grief. And so if you don't think there's a wound deep in Joseph here that's brewing, you don't think there's this father wound that's, that's festering in Joseph, man, you're, you're not reading the text. I mean, there's something brewing in him. So what we see at this point in the story, we see Joseph's story beginning to come into focus. We see this lower story, what God has been doing in Joseph's life over the past 13 years, how he's been molding him and shaping him and preparing him. And hear me when I say this, God's plan is to have the right person with the right heart at the right place at the right time for his righteous purposes. And so God has been working in Joseph's life for 13 years to make sure he has the right heart, to make sure he has the right character because God has got a massive calling on his life. And what is that calling? Why is all this happening? Look at the next verse, verse 53. It says, at last the seven years of bumper crops throughout the land of Egypt came to an end. Then the seven years of famine began and just as Joseph had predicted, the famine also struck all the surrounding countries. But throughout Egypt, there was plenty of food. And eventually, however, the famine spread throughout the land of Egypt as well. And when the people cried out to Pharaoh for food, he told them, go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you to do. So with severe famine everywhere, Joseph opened up the storehouses and distributed grain to the Egyptians. For the famine was severe throughout the land of Egypt. And people from all around came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe throughout the world. And so just north of the country of Egypt was the land of Canaan. And in the land of Canaan lived a guy by the name of Jacob who God renamed Israel. And this guy, Israel, had sons. And those sons one day would become the 12 tribes of Israel. 
And those 12 tribes would be the priests and the, and the Levites. They would, be the, they would be the warriors and the kings. They would be the prophets. And, and they, they would be these people. And they would be God's people, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, the son of Israel. It would be from this line. It would be from this family. It would be from these people that God would bring his son Jesus into the world. You see, there's something so much bigger at play here. This isn't just an exercise in Joseph's life. God is working his upper story. His upper story is always about salvation. And so Jacob hears there's food, that there's food down in, in Egypt, and, and they're in Canaan. They're perishing. People are dying. It is bleak. This famine has gone on and on and on. So he says, hey, guys, take the donkey south. Take them to Egypt. You go get some food. So his brothers saddled up uh, their donkeys, and they went to Egypt. They went to the local Walmarts, and they loaded up all their donkeys with all the stuff that they needed, and they went to the checkout line, and they get there, and guess who the cashier is? Joseph, who God placed there 13 years ago. And for 13 years, he's been working to make sure that Joseph was the right person with the right heart at the right place at the right time for God's righteous purposes. You see what God is doing? This is a bigger plan. This isn't just about Joseph. This is about what God is doing, not just for his people then, but for you and me today. Listen to what the psalmist writes about this. It says in Psalm 105, he called for a famine on the land of Canaan, cutting off its food supply. Then he sent someone to Egypt ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with fetters and placed his neck in an iron collar until the time came to fulfill his dreams. The Lord tested Joseph's character. Then Pharaoh sent for him and set him free. The ruler of the nation opened his prison door. And Joseph was put in charge of all the king's household. He became ruler over all the king's possessions. He could instruct the king's aides as he pleased and teach the king's advisors. And it says there in the middle of this that the Lord tested Joseph's character. On the count of three, say tested. One, two, three. Now, this doesn't mean that he gave him a number two pencil and a little sheet with little bubbles to fill in. When he says testing, this isn't a pass or fail and you're getting a grade. When the Bible says tested, what it means is that his character was being tested. That God was trying to refine Joseph, to purify Joseph. That there were things in Joseph that God needed to remove so that his character could match the calling that he had for him. And so it took 13 years for this testing to occur. 13 years for Joseph to finally learn the lesson that God needed him to learn so that he could be the person that God needed him to be for God's ultimate purpose of saving his family. And because he saved his family, he saved the people. And because he saved a people, he saved our Savior, Jesus Christ, who saved you and me. God was working a big plan. His upper story and lower story, it's amazing that these two things come together. And so please see that God didn't just take Joseph to, to Bible boot camp here, all right? This isn't just about Joseph becoming a better disciple. No, God has an upper story he's working out here. And, and so let me just ask you, are you in a season of waiting right now? Are you in one of those seasons right now where you're waiting for it to be over and you can't wait for this season of suffering, this season of hardship, that you feel like you're truly in this, this prison, maybe forgotten, alone, abandoned, wondering what God is up to in this moment? Listen, when we find ourselves in these seasons, it's so easy and it's natural for us to wanna throw ourselves that little pity party and, and start asking God the, the why questions. But let me challenge you, and what we've been learning from Joseph is not to, to ask the why question, but maybe it's time for us to start asking the what questions. God, what are you trying to show me? What, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to reveal about me in my life that, that I might need to work on? God, God, what is it in my life like Joseph that you're, you're trying to, to purify? What are you using humility for to change me? so that I can be the right person with the right heart at the right place at the right time to fulfill your righteous purpose for my life and for your upper story? Maybe that's the question we need to start asking. Well, let me wrap up by saying two things. Two things about seasons of waiting. Number one, and this is gonna be hard for some of us to hear, but number one, there may not be an end to your waiting. I just need to be honest with you. 
transparent and say that in a graceful, loving, compassionate way as your friend and your pastor. There may not be an end to your waiting. Listen, I know there are pastors and there are places that teach this prosperity gospel that it's gonna be all good, that it's all gonna be good. Listen, one day it will all be good, I promise. But here on earth, that may not be the case. I mean, for Joseph, it was 13 years. And maybe you're on the Joseph plan, I don't know. For, for David, it was 17 years. For the apostle Paul, it was his entire life following Jesus. Paul talks about through his writings, he talks about through his letters, this, this season of suffering, this, this prison that he was in. He talks about how many times he went to Jesus and said, Jesus, please remove this from me. Jesus, please take this away from me. Please remove this season from my life. And he never does. In fact, one of my favorite words, the most comforting words I think in the Bible are, are what Paul records Jesus said to him. When he asked Jesus to remove the thorn from his side, he said, Jesus told me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul responds by saying, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I, I take delight in weaknesses and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. And listen, maybe right now those words are a comfort to you. Maybe those words you just need to hear and learn, just like so many of us going through different seasons, that, that in the good seasons and the bad seasons, we gotta find a way to be able to praise God and thank Him, no matter what might be happening, that He is good and He is for us. And so if you're in a season, I don't wanna discourage you, but I wanna be honest with you, maybe that season of waiting is not gonna end. And maybe your healing is not gonna come here on earth, but maybe it's gonna happen the moment you close your eyes here and you open them in the presence of Jesus. But until then, His grace is enough. And His power is made perfect in our weakness. And so maybe that's you, but maybe right now you're in a season of waiting and maybe what God is doing is, is God is preparing you for something. The season you're in right now, the season of preparation isn't God calling a timeout on your life. It isn't a pause on your life plan that God's just going, hey, just stop everything till you figure this out. No, this season is part of your journey, part of you figuring out who God made you to be. And so yes, it may be difficult, but don't rush through it. Embrace what God is doing because maybe you're in a season where you're waiting for, for a a doctor's report to come and give you relief. Maybe you're in a season where it's just chronic pain day in and day out and you're just looking for someone to give you something that's gonna take away that pain. Or maybe you're in a marriage right now that's loveless. Maybe you're in a marriage right now where, where one loves Jesus and one doesn't love Jesus. And you're like, man, what, what am I doing here? Or maybe you're in a job that just feels like a dead end and you got a boss that's a, a jerk and you got some coworkers that you really don't enjoy very much. Maybe you feel like, man, what am I doing here? Or, or maybe you're in a season financially or a season spiritually, like you just feel like there's nothing happening. Listen, God is using those moments in your life to transform you. And he's more likely using humility to help us to become who he's created us to be because not only does he wanna change your life, but man, he's got some lives around you that he wants to change as well. And so hear these words of the Apostle Paul. I think these are good words to wrap up this conversation today. He says this, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. It doesn't seem like it in a moment, does it? He says, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and it will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now, rather we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Turn to the person next to you and say, hold on. Turn to the person on the other side and say, hold on. Say, say to the person on the other side, the time is coming. Turn to the person on the other side and say, the time is coming. Listen, our season of pits and prisons may not last forever, but in that season, God is doing something in our lives. And it's so difficult for us sometimes to look to the upper story, to look to the things that are eternal because we're so focused on the here and now in me. And I wanna encourage you as we've learned from Joseph's life, remain faithful, remain faithful, remain faithful, remain faithful, remain faithful. At a time, he, will lift you up. He will lift you up. 
Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this life of Joseph because we can so relate to this guy. And I just pray for all my friends in this room who may be in a tough season right now, the season of waiting where it's difficult, it's hard, it's scary, it's depressing, it's, it's maddening, it's confusing. I just pray for your peace, your peace to just invade their life and for you to just remind them some way, somehow today how faithful you are to us and to hold on, to hold on through these tough times, through these, these seasons of waiting, these, these seasons of, of prisons in our life. And for us to know that in these tough moments, in these tough seasons, that you're so close to us and you're working so hard in our lives. And so help us in these seasons to wait well and to wait on you. And know that you're not just working in our lives, but you're working in the lives of other people and to focus our attention not on things that we see here and now, the problems we're facing, but to focus our attention on you and your upper story because you are faithful. We love you, Jesus. We need you so desperately. Meet us in these difficult places of life. We trust in you. So Jesus, less of us and more of you. It's in your name we pray, amen.